You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You are now entering the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, a show that uncovers what's fact, what's fake, and what's fun in the crazy world of pseudo archaeology. Hello and welcome to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 100, with your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella. And tonight, we expose Dr. Andrew Kinkella as the archaeological fraud that he is. So, what's going on here on our special 100th episode? Why this unmasking at this time? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the world needs to know this. They need to know who Andrew Kinkella really is underneath the smiles and the jokes and all of that. Who is this person? He's a fraud. That's who he is. I have gotten together six different charges against him that he's going to have to answer to by the end of this podcast. I'm going to go through these. And by the end of this, I think you'll agree with me that he is an absolute 100% fraud. So, what do I mean by fraud? I mean that this person has willfully acted to make archaeology seem fun. Oh, he has. He's willfully used cliches like Indiana Jones. Oh, he sure has. He has willfully bragged about his own experiences in the jungle and in other exotic places around the world. I know, I know. I know you want to cover your ears about now, but keep them open, friends. Here we go, down the list. And I've put these in order of earliest to most recent. So we can talk about his fraudulent attitudes early on and then go forward in time to his most recent horrific choices. First, Dr. Kinkella is an archaeological fraud just in the discipline of archaeology itself. You know what? He has never been to Egypt yeah, let that one sink in. So he doesn't know firsthand about King Tut or any of that. You know what? He teaches a class called Egyptology, where, of course, he makes it exciting by bringing up Howard Carter, Giovanni Belzoni, oh, and so on. He's never been that fraud. He has been to the ancient Maya world. I'll give him that much. He has worked in local California archaeology. I will give him that in a pinch. And you know what? He even spent a summer in Germany. But you know what? He's never even been to the Southern Hemisphere. Dude, he's never even crossed. <laughs> never even crossed the equator. What's wrong with him? So his actual experiences... Are limited. Yeah, he knows the Maya stuff pretty good. Sure, Belize, yeah. You know, California in the southwestern area of the United States. Okay, he has worked in Mexico some and in Guatemala. And yes, that summer in Germany. But that's it, man. Can't even believe you listen to him. You know what else? On top of this, don't don't get me started on the second thing where he's a total fraud. It's in his teaching. You know, he teaches about the Maya, which he can, you know, he vaguely knows about. But he has a class that he's titled Mysteries of the Ancient Maya. How dare he? He used the word mysteries. Come on. He just play into the cliches. You don't want that. You want a well-reasoned Excel spreadsheet that lists the obsidian blades found in the Maya area of the classic period. I know that's what you want. You don't want someone pushing the interesting parts and the fun parts and, dare I say, the frivolous parts that are just fun to learn about. 
Oh, he does that. Oh, God, at the same time, how many jungle stories does he have? Do I have to hear another one of those? Oh, so there I was in Belize. Oh, good Lord. Self-serving. You think I'm almost done? Oh, I'm just getting started. Along with the teaching. Oh, and he teaches a bunch of different classes. So he teaches like Mysteries of Ancient Maya, teach Egyptology, intro to archaeology a ton. Like you want this person to intro you into the archaeology world. He's teach cultural anthropology and biological anthropology. He has four Saturday classes he teaches and excavation and mapping and lab work and archaeology and the law. Oh, God, there's some other ones in there, too. I just it's it's just really sad that the youth of today have to be exposed to this person. Related to his teaching, the third charge against him, his public speaking. Sure, he has a loud voice. You can't get away from it. But it's much like his teaching. He just pushes his swashbuckling and his jungle stories again. Oh, yeah, let me hear again. Oh, so there I was in Belize. Oh, yeah, let me get in line for that. Bunch of maps of places where he's been. Bunch of funny photos. Oh, look at you. Yes, I see. Look at you acting funny. Oh, look, you're really sweaty in the jungle. Yeah, I see. Ooh, you're a real archaeologist. I know. I know. <sighs> you believe that's only three? Three out of six. Oh, and I'm not even to the meat of it. Let's go to number four in print. You know, this guy hasn't done enough articles. You know, he hasn't. I mean, yes, he's done some. Yes, he has pu been published in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, I'll have you know, but he'll tell you that, you know, just to brag, look at me in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal. Yes, he's done that. Yeah, he has a couple other publications. I would call his publications vaguely light in terms of how long he's been in the industry. But he has, he does have some scientific publications out there, but every good has a bad. He has written a textbook. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of academic does that? Writes a textbook. Well, he did it, of course, because he's not a real academic. Because he cares about bringing archaeology to the public. Oh, how dirty. He has a, oh, and check this out. Check this out. You know what his, his textbook's called? And I quote, archaeology is awesome. Embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, God. And again, cover your ears. The font on the front cover of Archaeology is Awesome is an obvious ripoff of the Raiders of the Lost Ark font. And that was his idea. No, other people didn't tell him to do that. He went into the publisher and said, hey, I have this idea. Why don't we use the Indiana Jones font on this book? And more importantly, the entire book Looks like it fell off the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland. And that's what he wanted. He told them that. Oh, I know. Oh, I've heard him say it. Archaeology is awesome. Once you open the book, you know what you see? Every chapter starts with one of his stories. Oh, God, what a narcissist. Oh, so there I was in the desert. Whatever. And then onward, if this guy wasn't enough of a narcissist. In his textbook, he wrote for his classes, you open it up and every couple pages, there's a QR code that brings you to, you guessed it, his YouTube channel where you watch him talk about archaeology. How far into himself is he? I don't think he can go any further in terms of the exploring of his own narcissistic soul. Do you? I don't. Oh, but there's more. So that was number four. Yeah. Dr. Andrew Kinkella in print. Shameful. Number five, his podcasting career as you listen to him right now this is where the fraud just goes off the meter you know what he did he wiggled himself into the crm archaeological podcast because one of his old students was on it 
Right. So he wiggles in any new he knew Chris, who runs all this a little bit here and there from before. So he uses that thin connection to get into the pseudo archaeology. Po- or sorry, to get into this. See, he even messes stuff up. He can't even talk right. And he's got two podcasts. Oh my God. So he goes on the CRM podcast. How much CRM work has he really done? Yes, he's done some. Yes, you could say for there uh, is about two years in his life where he was a full time CRM archaeologist. Yeah, he's got some, but you know what? I know people with more. But no, let's listen to Dr. Andrew Kinkella spew about CRM, about cultural resource management, about something that's very specific for a very specific audience. No. Oh, please tell me. Oh, professor. All about CRM. So, yeah, he does that. But you know what? His need of the spotlight knows no boundary. So being part of one podcast wasn't enough for him. No. So he goes and he suggests that he, I know, shocking. He suggests that he himself should be the lone podcaster. On the Pseudo Archaeology podcast, which you're listening to right now. Thank God you're hearing me unveil who this criminal really is. And in that podcast, you know, I mean, he does his research. Is he a little late with his upload sometimes? Maybe. I think he is. But I guess he tries. I guess, you know, he does his best, whatever that is. But finally... And you know, I saved the most brutal charge for last. Dr. Andrew Kinkella is on television. Ugh, I know. What kind of real archaeologist goes on television? And oh, he's not on some documentary on his own work. No, he goes on, he goes on shows that are usually on the Science Channel, which I guess gives him a little, if he thinks that, The television media is somehow a reasonable place for an academic to go. We all know it's not. He's been on three shows, which I'm sure he would want me to tell you all about. Well, I'll tell you a little just because you need to know. First, he's been on a show called What on Earth? Spurious. What on Earth? The setup there is where they find something with a satellite and they zoom in on this image on Earth and they go, what is that? And they usually come up with some silly reasoning as to what it is. Sure, at the end, they tell you the true story of what it is, but they do take time talking about what ifs before they get to the real science behind it. I know you and I both would prefer just a spreadsheet, but no, they make a story out of it. Wasting our time. Then he was on another show called Ancient Unexplained Files. Look at those words. Ancient Unexplained. Where they asked him all kinds of things about just about every archaeological site on Earth for hours and hours. They asked him and he dutifully replied because he wants to be on TV, doesn't he? So he answers their questions about archaeology. You know what? And I know this. They asked him about stuff sometimes that he didn't know a whole hell of a lot about. He didn't know a lot about it. No. He didn't know a whole hell of a lot. And you know what he did? He gave his best answer. He even tried to look up some of the stuff before, but he was mostly right. Mostly. Oh, but that's not that's not enough. You know what? He is now on a show called Mysteries in the Jungle. Oh, my God. I know. You don't want to tune in. I know. Because, oh, yes, yes, yes. There I was in the jungles of Belize. Now for a television audience. Yeah. He's on that now. Which is on every Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific. C. Narcissist. Telling you when it is. Just so you'll tune in and you'll never guess what's in Mysteries of the Jungle. Oh, sorry. See, he even gets it wrong. He's so out of it. It's called Secrets in the Jungle, not Mysteries in the Jungle. Secrets in the Jungle. Pathetic. 
So secrets in the jungle. And they expose certain new digs that have been done, new excavations. They talk about them. They talk about LIDAR and this kind of thing. No spreadsheet at all. Just on television. I, for one, won't watch that show. But you know what? Because I'm, I'm someone who cares about my audience. Let's allow him. We will allow him to retort. When we come back, let's listen to this sniveling pseudo professor's defense on his choices in his archaeological life. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 100, our special episode where we reveal the fraudulent underbelly of Dr. Andrew Kinkella. So, in our last segment, there were a lot of charges levied against me, you know? And unfortunately, this is the kind of stuff that I've really dealt with <laughs> throughout my career. And I think I'd like to take these charges on one at a time and kind of explain to you guys the ideas behind the choices that I made and maybe make it seem like I'm maybe not as big of a fraud as some may say. So first off, in terms of working in archaeology, one thing that's fantastic about being an archaeologist is people ask you about it all the time, right? They they meet you in airports, they just sort of in the grocery store, you're at a dinner, wherever, and people will ask you about your career in archaeology, and you can't be everywhere. So you just have to make your best guess of things, which I do. I am not allergic to saying I don't know. But what I have found is, as a quote-unquote real archaeologist, it is better to give your guess than to just leave it up to Uncle Frank, who's just going to spout nonsense. So for budding archaeologists out there, you know what? Take on the questions that you get from the public all the time. You know, so my, my career in archaeology, I'm very open about it. No, I've never been south of the equator. That's pretty sad. I, I hope to at some point. And I've never been to Egypt. What's so funny is as soon as somebody hears that I've never been to Egypt my whole career, it makes me less of an archaeologist. Doesn't matter where else you've worked. You haven't been to Egypt? Well, you're just a second stringer, my friend. So my defense on my career in archaeology is that, uh, hey, I've done my best shot. I have been out there. I have really done field work. I do know what it's like. I do think most of the stuff that I talk about does have an air of I've been there because I have. And I do really take seriously bringing my career highlights and lowlights to the general public and to my students, because I want everyone to know what it's like. I want to give you the visceral feeling of archaeology as a discipline. I want to expose it a little bit as it needs to be exposed, but I also want to defend it as it needs to be defended. That's why I love the pseudo archaeology podcast so much. <laughs> But career-wise, yeah, I'm really a minist, you know, and a local California archaeologist is really who I am. And that's the stuff I know in my bones. But the, uh, the other stuff, I find that being a community college professor, I have had to keep my general side of archaeology very strong so I can talk to my students about it and, and so on and so forth. Speaking of that, the second charge of my teaching, I'll tell you this much. You got to fill the seats, my friends. Got to get some suckers in those seats. You know what I'm saying? So it pays for you to be a dynamic teacher, a dynamic college professor and lecturer. And that's something that I take seriously. And I, am I going to pull from the sort of mystery aspect of things? Am I going to pull from what's sort of hot and what, what students are really curious about? Sure I am. Am I going to use cliches to my advantage? Oh, have you seen what kind of car I drive? Oh, sure I am. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that because it's used in honesty. I'm honest about it. I want the teaching to be as fun for me as it is for everyone else. So I found that like, if I'm having fun, just like anyone else who has a career that's on stage, the fun is infectious. You know, so am I going to go for every single joke there is? Oh, you bet. 
You know, am I just going to lay it out there? Sure I am. <laughs> because that's what makes it fun. I mean, you're teaching archaeology, man. Got to have a little fun. So leave me alone with my teaching. Number three, the public speaking world. It's even more so. You have a moment to hook to the general public. You know, you have a moment to bring them into this archaeology world. And you cannot take the academic way out. I've seen so many academics do this, right? They'll think I'm a fraud or it's not even really that I'm a fraud so much that I'm just as I'm secondary. I've gotten many side glances from my academic counterparts because talking like that in front of an audience is just not done. Making a joke of that caliber where they actually laugh from their stomach. That's not done. Right. And I have I've <laughs> I've seen certain academics kind of distance from me because they feel weird because it, because it's a bit of a break of the mold, you know, and I'm not alone. I have friends of mine who do the same thing and we all joke to each other about some of this stuff. You know, the public speaking world, it, it demands that, you know, it, it demands that you're dynamic. Nobody wants to hear the boring parts and, you know, and pieces and that kind of stuff. And that's OK. It, it's not necessary in a public speaking situation. Right. Another thing I've really learned in whether it's you know teaching or public speaking, this world of stuff, you can't sit and talk about exceptions to the rule. Because, yes, there's always exceptions. You know, if I'm talking about the ancient Maya and I go, you know, oh, well, you see, the pre-classic period ended at this date. Yes, I know. Underneath it all, there were a handful of sites where you could say the pre-classic culture kind of went on longer and this kind of thing. But I can't say that to an audience or they're going to be confused. Every nerdy academic I've ever known goes down the rabbit hole of exceptions to the rule. So at the end of your, their presentation, you have no idea what you just heard. You're like, wait, what? I know that, wait, the Maya pre-classic, wait, is it, is it 250 AD it ends or wait, what? You know, it's, we all know those, there's exceptions, but those are for grad students, you know, to figure out. It's not for the general public. Half the time when people say that I've said something wrong, you know, or that, that I'm somehow not doing due diligence or acting in good faith. It's about these kind of exceptions. You know, an academic will come up to me and be like, well, no, wait, you see, you haven't, you didn't discuss the, the caves in your area at all. It's like, no, I know I didn't because it wasn't pertinent to the main story. It just takes away. So I think the art and science of boiling stuff down to a nice little piece of candy is awesome. And I am proud of it. Deal with the world. I am proud of my fraudulent aspects in terms of that. But I move on to the other charges against me. So the print world. Oh, yes. The blatant pull from Indiana Jones when I used its font in Indy's font for my textbook. I love it. And you know what? The, what's funny is the publishers did, too. And what you'll find as an archaeologist trying to walk that fine line of academia versus the public, if you lean a little more into the public world, the public realm, there is a lot of fruit and goodness to be collected there, my friends. I love doing it, you know, and I don't feel like I'm somehow doing things wrong or uh, giving people the wrong idea of things. I'm making things brief and understandable. And I would hope that other academics would have the understanding that I know the exceptions, but I'm not bringing them up for obvious reasons. So, yes, my world in writing and I will do more writing. The writing for the public for me is really, really satisfying. So I want to continue doing that and, and make it more open for more of the general public. And yes, I will do more academic writing because that goes with the job. It's part of the career. But I have to say, it's not as satisfying. And there's many out there who do it. Fifth, defending myself from my podcast. Well, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and I, I really enjoy my co-hosts on the CRM Archaeology podcast. That's one that I really recommend to my students in archaeology. The CRM Archaeology podcast is a great one 
to get a feel for, okay, what happens next? What happens after you get out of grad school or out of getting a BA or an AA? If you're just trying to get into the CRM field, what's a day in the life like? What should you do? What should you not do? What should you buy? What do you need? Like those shows are awesome. And I, I recommend those shows to my students all the time. And I have to tell you guys, I even recommend the ones that I'm not in. I know. I know you're shocked. I know. Why would I do such a thing? Uh, those are those are great. Again, it's a narrow it's a narrower audience, understandably, but there's it's so good for that. So I have a lot of like pride to be a part of that and to be a part of those other people. They're the top quality co-hosts that I'm that I'm there with. Those guys are just great. And and I think they all have a bit of a feeling towards what I'm telling all you guys right now in terms of kind of the underbelly of the choices you have to make in order to bring archaeological ideas, which sometimes can be intrinsically pretty complicated, to an audience and have fun with it. Have a little fun. You know, have a laugh. Dude, life's too short. So, yeah, the podcast, the podcast thing, I'm super happy to do. And the pseudo archaeology podcast, which you are listening to right now, did sort of fall into my lap. Like I saw a need. I saw this show that was out, which has, hadn't been re-upped for like four years. And I'm like, that's a great idea for a podcast. I'll just re-up it. You know, so that's my defense for that. And finally, the tough one, the television world. How do I defend myself? Well, here's what I would say. I've watched some of the shows that I've been on and I have a real love hate against watching myself. It's funny. You know what? I look forward more to listening to myself. Like if a, if one of these podcasts comes out of mine, I look more forward to it because I want to see how it came out because I knew it was like my baby. And so I want to see if it reached where I thought it would for television. I'm just a cog in a much larger machine. So sometimes I am like reticent to watch because so there's certain things I've been in, you know, that I didn't watch at all, or I just watched a little bit or, you know, but, but I do feel like I should watch it just to make sure everything came out. I will say most things I've been in, I've watched, you know, and I'm, I'm happy with it. It's never perfect. So the television world is different because you're just part of a much larger scope. And I feel for the producers of those kinds of television shows on the Discovery Channel, on the Science Channel, right? And even, yes, on the History Channel. I feel for those guys because that world, a lot of you guys don't, don't know that world. That world is where th these people have to come up with shows that will be greenlit, where the production company will get behind it and actually make it. So they are constantly throwing ideas out. These are smart people. These are not dummies. Sometimes people think, oh, well, they made like ancient aliens. They must be dumb. No, 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 no. These people are smart. And these people are trying to get an audience because, yes, you could make the most correct archaeological show ever. But if it's boring and there's no audience for it, it doesn't matter. So you have to strike that balance. I am proud of every show I've been in. On television, I think the producers and the director and the cameraman and the sound guys did a fantastic job. I think that's the easiest place to look for my fraudulent activities. Because if you see some of the stuff I've said on television, you could you could you might know the other side of the story or be like, oh, well, I would explain it a slightly different way. But but you have to realize that that had to be produced under very specific tolerances for a very specific storyline. And I will also uh, say that I'm also proud of all the other people I work with as, as I work through past preservers, who's kind of my representation, the other personalities, I would say, sort of, these are all other professionals in the world of archaeology or geology. You know, there's a couple other ologies in there, history, that we all are trying our due diligence best to get the real story to you guys. And if you think as you watch one of these shows that it's a little off or you don't like it, this is where social media will really start to knock, not just me, but anyone who's a part of these shows. I would dare them to read the treatment for it before we got involved. Because you know what? If they don't hire an archaeologist, they're going to hire an actor. So isn't it better to have somebody like me or my other colleagues who do this where we can at least at the last minute we can change 
the script, I'll say script, like sometimes it's very just kind of like beats that you're going to talk to. It's all over the place. I've, I've had ones where there is a script that I kind of riff on just to tell the real story. I will say I'm not just reading lines or something like that. So th- they are good at trying to get their hosts to say real stuff because they do want the real story, but they want to be able to couch it in a television show that's going to sell. So I'm, I'm proud of that stuff. That is a very, very difficult world to work in. You know, those shows being a presenter, I guess you would say that's, that's what I've done. And, and the friends of mine who've, who've done it as well, they know we are the few and the proud, but we know the difficulties of that. Those are very difficult shoot days where we are put in literally a hot seat. I mean, it looks like an interrogation seat lights on you one seat and then you just start to answer questions about archaeology or tell little stories about archaeology for hours, like 11 hours, you know, however long. It's a long time. And you have to keep up your energy and you have to keep it interesting for the audience. So that's what I would defend myself for my fraudulent charges by saying that I'm trying my best just to get along. And when we get back, what should we do with me? And welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 100 The Unmasking of Dr. Andrew Kinkella, Archaeological Fraud. Now, what to do with him? We've heard both sides, we've heard the charges levied against him from his career in archaeology to his teaching to his public speaking, to what he's written in print, to his podcast career, and even television. So what to do with him? Should he be canceled? Should he be escorted to a cave never to return? Or should we allow him to continue unleashed on the unsuspecting world? Well, I would gingerly vote to keep him around. And why is this? It's because I will tell you guys that walking that line has been hard. It has been enjoyable, but there are times when you really feel like you are just in darkness, you know, because there's not too many people to follow. I'm a huge fan of the Neil deGrasse Tysons of the world, of the Bill Nye, the science guys of the world. I love those guys. We need more, more of that. If I may be so bold and egotistical and narcissistic, more of me. Please, other archaeologists out there, be me. (laughs) My point there is we are dying for public outreach, right? Here's how much of a fraud I am. If the show Ancient Aliens came to me and asked me to be on it, I would agree. I would totally do it. But I would tell them the same thing that I have told every production company, every book publishing firm, every public speaking engagement I've ever had, which is, look, I'm going to tell the factual truth. I am not going to say that maybe it was aliens. I'm not going to say it was aliens. I'm not going to leave the question mark out there that maybe. I'm going to say no, there's not. 100% zero chance, right? I've told all these places that kind of stuff. And sometimes they're a little bummed. Sometimes I don't book the gig. Just depends. But it's easy. I'm at the point in my career where it's very easy for me to be honest. So... Would I be on an ancient aliens or something like that? I I totally would because that's where you can do good. That's where you can do good for the world of science and facts because that's the end of the lion's den, you know? And if they portray me as like the egghead wrong scientist, so what? I get to talk to a different audience for a handful of minutes about something in my factually scientific way. And a couple people might go with it. 
You know, even if you see it couched in some ancient alien silliness, they might go with my setup. Even as they say, well, look at that academic over there. He doesn't know. He's so close mind. Oh, look at that narrow minded loser. Right? Where people watching it might just go, hey, you know, he might be right. You know, the pyramids might not be aligned to Orion's belt. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. You see what I'm saying? And I think that idea is so important for the academic realm. And I'm not here just to poo-poo academic archaeology. It's academia in general with all this stuff. They look at you like you're a little unclean and that you're like a little bit of a joke because you're not doing it right. (laughs) But, you know, I'm like... Yeah, you know what? I think I am doing it right because I'm getting asses in the seats of intro to archaeology and you're going to need that because all you teach is advanced classes in archaeology. So you might want a couple students in there from time to time. I don't know. Prove me wrong. So, yeah, you know, I take I take all this stuff really super serious. Another thing that, that the academic world, they will look down on you writing things like textbooks or writing things like an article for a very general audience. And, and they'll always, they will take the easiest road out. They will do what I talked about in the previous segment where they will, they will poo poo you because you didn't bring up the exceptions, you know, because it's such a time for them to virtue signal and go, look at me, look how smart I am. Look how much I know. You see King Kelly, he didn't bring up that. You see pre-classic pottery was a little smoother. Like, yeah, I didn't, but I know it, you know, but they're so, they're so into showing how smart they are that they will poo poo you for doing something that's basic. But I swear you guys, there is genius in the basic, you know? And my other point, whenever somebody gets down on me for doing something for the public, my retort, if I may, is, okay, you think I sucked at that? You do it. You go on TV. You go on a show. Yeah, get on there. Get right up there, my little academic friend. Get on there, turn the cameras on, and give me a story. Tell me about ancient Egypt, would you? Exactly. (laughs) So, I mean, part of it, I swear... But it's just like your mama told you when you were a kid. It's jealousy, man. <laughs> oh, and that's okay. You know, if you get an en- enemy or two in this world, good for you. It means you're doing something right. <sighs> and I'll say one more thing. You know, when I was a kid, what got me into archaeology, I loved Indiana Jones. I loved In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. I loved that show. And even as like a 10 year old, I knew it was kind of BS, you know, I knew in Raiders of the Lost Ark, there wasn't really a huge boulder that rolls after you. I knew that some of the stuff they would say about like Easter Island on In Search Of, I know that wasn't 100% true, but so what? It was a great story and it hooked me in to then learn the true facts of archaeology in the future. So I don't get completely down on these shows. I do. Yes. You know, ancient aliens, if it's on the history channel and this kind of thing, and purports that it's like factual when it's not. And uh, there's a lot of just shysters out there who are just selling their wares, talking complete nonsense and BS silliness. Those guys do bring me down a little bit, but what, I think we have to look at at the end here, something that I take seriously is the art and science of storytelling. I think if you've listened to the pseudo archaeology podcast so far, you've seen me really break most stories down. This one's weird because, you know, I'm I'm crucifying myself. You know, this one's a weird one. But usually there's an intro. I have an intro where I kind of talk about how I'm connected to the story. Then I kind of have a middle part where I go deep into the story itself and tell you the various cast of characters and what happens. And then at the end, we kind of come to our conclusion of, oh, this is what we think, right? That is, that is very conscious. The art and science of storytelling. I love storytelling. 
whether it be the construction of a story, whether it be the construction of a screenplay, whether it be construction of a television show, whether it be a construction of mythology. I love mythology. Ah, mythology is great, right? That storytelling thing that's so human. That's what we kind of have to remember in the end is that when we are talking about archaeology, we must communicate in storytelling form. And yes, you may see me as a fraud as I meld, honestly, the unmeldable into a story for your liking. But in the end, am I a fraud? Now, I act in good faith, and I'm just a guy trying to make archaeology fun for the general public. And with that, we are going to do some pseudo-archaeology next time when I see you. Goodbye, my friends. Thanks for listening to the Pseudo-Archaeology Podcast. Please like and subscribe wherever you like and subscribe. And if you have questions for me, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, feel free to reach out using the links below or go to my YouTube channel, Kinkella Teaches Archaeology. See you guys next time. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.